Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special edition of the Boxing Asylum Nuthouse brought to you by BoxingAsylum.com. We have a special guest today, the associate editor of Ring Magazine and the editor of RingTV.com, Doug Fisher. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Guys, um, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's it's an absolute uh, pleasure to have you here. Um, and just just to get straight to it, um, give give uh, our listeners a background about what what brought you to uh, being involved in uh, boxing publications. Uh, boxing publications started for me as um, just a stringer. Um, you know, I've always been a fight fan. Uh, I was a big Muhammad Ali fan in the seventies. Um, I was born in nineteen seventy. I'm forty two. I'll, I'll be forty three. Um, in, uh, this May. Um, so, you know, when I was just starting to, to become uh, aware of the sports and entertainment world, Muhammad Ali was the absolute king. He was uh, in his second reign as heavyweight champion of the world, and he was on network television. And, um, you know, obviously he was larger than life. So I wasn't a boxing fan, I wasn't really a sports fan, but I was a big Muhammad Ali fan. And I think, you know, Ali was sort of the entree into boxing. And about the time that I became aware of Muhammad Ali was about the time of the, the 1976 Olympics, which had just tremendous uh, American talent, um, primarily Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh, and when Muhammad Ali was, was clearly on the decline and when he was, um, you know, retired, Sugar Ray Leonard sort of felt that spot as like um, my hero. You know what I mean? The living legend out there that I that I followed and, and through Leonard. I gained an appreciation of the sport of boxing itself. With Muhammad Ali, it was just about Ali. With Sugar Ray Leonard, I suddenly became aware of weight classes. There was, you know, weight classes that were lighter than heavyweight. Um, and from the guys that Leonard fought, like Roberto Duran and Thomas Hearns, I learned about other tremendous fighters, you know, active fighters at that time. And, you know, at some point, I became one of these guys that, you know, had to have as much information about the sport um, as possible. And I was like that in the early eighties with the retirement of Leonard, I kind of fell out of it, but I came back. I got back into the sport. Um, like my junior or senior year in high school, when, um, Leonard came out of retirement to fight Marvin Hagler. And at this time, Mike Tyson was fighting like every other month. It seemed like on HBO. And he was of course, very exciting. And, um, I would say I've been a, just a hardcore fight fan since the late eighties. Um, so when I, when I went to college and I got my degree in, in communications and journalism and I went on to get a, a master's degree um, from Columbia's uh, uh, graduate program in journalism, um, I relocated to the West Coast where I knew there was sort of a thriving boxing scene. I knew there were boxing gyms out here. I'd read about the stories. Um, I'd watched um, forum boxing shows uh, on, on what was then called the Prime Network. Um, it's basically now uh, Fox Sports um, Net, but where I lived in the Midwest, like – you know, two o'clock in the morning, they would show um, the broadcast um, uh, from the Great Western Forum. And I was watching guys like uh, Chiquita Gonzalez and um, uh, the late Gennaro Hernandez fight. And um, so I had a fascination with not just boxing, but like Mexican boxing, Mexican-American boxing and, and the whole West Coast, sort of Southern California boxing scene. So when I moved here in late 93, I couldn't wait to, to join a gym. I couldn't wait to start going to club shows um, in the valley, um, out in the desert, and, and of course um, in the Inglewood area where I live now, um, and, you know, and, and to see shows at the Great Western Forum, and I saw great shows with you know guys like Mark Two Sharp Johnson when uh, he was coming up, and Juan Manuel Marquez when he was coming up, uh, Marco Antonio Barrera as well. I mean, like before these guys were champions, you know, I, I was paying uh, money for a ticket to watch these guys fight. Um, right here in Inglewood, which was just awesome. Um, and I was working for a newspaper at the time, and they had a sports section. This is a weekly paper, um, kind of based in South Central Los Angeles. And the sports editor hated boxing. He covered everything but boxing. And I thought that was insane because there was so much boxing um, happening in the greater L.A. area at that time. Um, so I just asked him, hey, man, if you don't want to cover these you know, fights at the Forum or uh, you know, uh, the Grand Olympic Auditorium, which reopened in the mid-'90s, I said, I'll do it. You know, I wanted to do it just to get in free. So he was like, oh, you want to go cover this box and you know, go for it. So that's kind of how I got started. And um, I also was a stringer for, for some other newspapers, like the competing newspaper to my newspaper, which was the Sentinel, kind of like the largest African-American news, newspaper uh, you know, in, the, in the Southern California area. So I did some stringing for them, and I did this from like 
I'd say, you know, 94 through 96 and um, in 97, I kind of discovered the Internet. I mean, I knew the Internet was around, but I didn't even have an email account. Um, it wasn't something that really interested me, but um, a dude that trained at the same gym that I trained at. Uh, the L.A. Boxing Club, a guy named Gary Randall. He was way into the Internet. He was a graphic designer. He was a webmaster, and he was wanting to start up some kind of like a, uh, a, 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 a a boxing website, basically. But he didn't really know how to do it. He didn't have any sort of editorial background. And we were, we were good friends, and we sparred and stuff like that, and we just started working together. And um, we came up with House of Boxing. Actually, Gary came up with the name House of Boxing in 97. And it really just – it, it – um, it kind of snowballed from 97. I mean, by early 99, um, there were companies reaching out to us saying, hey, we're, we're interested in, in buying this this online property and, and um, paying you guys a salary. And um, we kind of just took in offers the entire year of 99, and we finally settled with this East Coast operation that we were introduced to by Shannon Briggs, who was uh, training with the late, great Emmanuel Stewart at the time. Uh, in the Big Bear area, uh, Manny Stewart was trying to start like a uh, a cronk gym west, and he had a a gym briefly in Big Bear. And we went up there, and um, you know, we interviewed Shannon and, and, and shot video of Shannon Briggs training for um, Francois Botha, who ironically was also training in Big Bear at the time. So um, we got to know Shannon, and Shannon's manager owned a, a company or was like the CEO of some publicly traded company. Um, I forget the name of it, as a matter of fact, <laughs> Worldwide Entertainment and Sports. And um, Mark had a lot of money. Mark had other people's money. You know, he was a good, uh, you know, fundraiser and a good guy, you know, starting up these sort of um, publicly traded um, entities. And um, Mark made us a great offer, and he bought House of Boxing. And, and just like that, in late 99, early 2000, um, what, what had been a hobby – became a full-time job for me and boxing writing on the internet has been a full-time job for me I think since February of 2000 that it's it's great when you can take something that was your passion and find a way to to make money from it so I mean congratulations on that one Doug that's the, that's the good stuff um, now let me let me ask you this you, you mentioned you know going through growing up and not even under you know the weight classes and all that and you know it's it's really a mystery you know when you first get into it just how much is going on but since that time what have you noticed as far as you know going on maybe sanctioning bodies titles and stuff like that over the last, the last 25 years what do you think has made the sport the most has made it more complicated compared to days past well, I, I don't think the sanctioning organizations help um, in that regard in, in making things simple for um, the general public. I don't, I don't think the sanctioning, bothers, sanctioning bodies bother hardcore fans. I think, you know, if you're really hardcore, I mean, you, you, you love them or, I mean, you, you, no one really loves them. But if you're a hardcore fan, you know, you just understand that they're, they're sort of um, part of the business of, of boxing and they are part of the sport. And they do serve as a certain benchmark for, for fighters. And we don't – if you're a hardcore fan, you know just because a guy has the IBF title um, in a certain weight class, that doesn't mean that he is the champion um, of, of that division. But it, that is confusing to the layperson. That is confusing to a, a casual fan um, you know, who will watch TV and, and you know, the, the commentators are, are naming three or four world champions at the same weight class. Um, that, that can be complicated. But I don't think that's what, what makes boxing um, uh, more complicated these days. I mean, I, I think the fact that it's not on network television all the time, I mean, I, I think that's the, the main thing is that it's, it's one step further away from public consumption. And the way things are in our society and most societies is if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. And it doesn't matter how good the product is, if it's not there for public consumption – um, and people can't consume it and take it in and get hooked on it, they're not going to get hooked on it. And, um, you know, I really wonder if I would have become a boxing fan if Muhammad Ali was fighting on pay-per-view, if Muhammad Ali wasn't fighting on ABC Sports, you know what I mean? I mean, I watched, you know, heavyweight championship fights, um, you know, Saturday afternoon uh, and, and sometimes uh, during prime time during the week. And um, so it was, it, was, it was hard for me to miss 
or anybody my age, you know, to, to miss Muhammad Ali, you know, because he was out there, he was loud, he was proud, and he was a, a natural-born entertainer. But he was also fighting a lot. He fought all the time. And, you know, if, if his fights weren't televised live on network television, then they were carried on network TV on, on a tape delay basis. And that changed. That, that ceased to be by the mid-1980s. And by the 1990s, um, you know, all of really, you know, elite world-class boxing was on, um, you know, in America, was on um, subscription cable networks, um, Showtime and, and HBO, which, you know, those, those networks, those premium cable networks were able to pay the managers, promoters, and boxers a lot more money than the networks were willing to shell out. But in accepting more money, um, basically the, the, the American boxing industry – um, move to a much smaller universe, and I mean, I think that's the main thing that that really prevents the casual fan from becoming a a, a diehard boxing nut like I was. And you know, even even in the late '80s and early '90s, when when this transition was happening, um, boxing was still very much available. I mean, I remember when I was in college, NBC had a Saturday afternoon program, I think, just called the Greatest Fights, and they had a, a panel. Um, that included uh, Marv Albert, and he was the um, he was sort of the moderator, and it had uh, Ferdy Pacheco and the late Archie Moore and uh, the late Angelo Dundee, I, you know, and and you know other sort of boxing luminaries um, would watch a, a great fight like a Joe Lewis fight, or they would watch the Thrilla in Manila, or you know, uh, you know Ali Foreman's uh, you know Rumble in the Jungle. And um, in between rounds, they would sort of, um, you know, analyze what we were watching. But it was this was this was a program that was on network television that was reintroducing great fights to a new generation. And if you happen to miss the the live broadcast on NBC, there were VHS tapes. This is back in the days of you know VCRs and 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 and. But the VHS tapes were available, of course, in video stores. Um, but also at your local grocery market, you know, and so, I, you know, there used to be these big bins of, um, of videotapes, so, you know, everything from the Three Stooges to Mighty Mouse cartoons um, to, to, you know, old sitcoms and, and old movies. But mixed in there would be these tapes of boxing. And um, if I happened to miss a fight like, uh, you know, I missed I wasn't able to watch the rematch between Sugar Ray Leonard and Thomas Hearns live. And I even met, you know, that that fight was a, like a closed circuit fight, but it was, um, you know, I think it was shown on um, HBO, and then it was shown, uh, I mean, a couple of weeks later on one of the networks, maybe CBS. I think it was CBS because Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy did the um, did the broadcast, um, with, you know, with the, the network commentators. But I was able to get a VHS tape that had both fights. It had the 1981 classic and the 1989 um, rematch on it, and I was also able to to collect the tapes. Of NBC's the greatest, you know, the great fights or the greatest fight series, you know, which was, um, you know, the Thrill in Manila, the Rumble in the Jungle. Um, there was a great documentary on um, all the tremendous heavyweight champions um, from the '70s, like Ali Frazier, Ken Norton, um, you know, Larry Holmes, and and, and George Foreman, um, called Champions Forever, and that was available. And so, if you were just a casual fan. You could pick up this videotape for just a couple of bucks and take it home and watch it. And if you had been in love with boxing but had fallen out of love with it, you fell in love with it again. And if you didn't know anything about boxing, you got bit by the bug. You know, you were like, "This is so awesome! This stuff. Well, where else can I can I watch it?" And you would you would find out about you know Friday night fights and uh, uh, USA Network's Tuesday night fights. You would go out and you would buy Ring Magazine or KO Magazine or Boxing Illustrated, and you would immerse yourself into the sport. And once you did that, you were, you're, you're pretty much diehard for life. I mean, that's how I was. I mean, I just immersed myself in the sport or re-immersed myself in the sport in the late 80s, um, early 90s as a college student. And I haven't looked back. And I think, you know, when it comes to people not understanding the sport or, 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 or viewing the sport as confusing and all that, it's because – they haven't really been able to immerse themselves in in it, and that's because it's really kind of in its own universe. It's just in this, you know, in the United States, it's just uh, you know, boxing at its highest level is pay per view, HBO, and Showtime, 
and it's um, just uh, you know a number of, of specialty websites. It's not covered um, extensively by the mainstream media. It's not in newspapers. It's not um, it's not on the um, nightly uh, sports news broadcast. You know, which and it used to be. So I mean, I think that's that's the number one factor when it comes to you know the general public being confused by the sport. Um, not being able to kind of jibe with it, kind of get in sync with it. And, and the boxing industry doesn't make that easy with um, all of the politics um, and, uh, you know, all of the bad blood and, um, you know, all of the uh, just the, the business of boxing getting in the way and superseding the sport of boxing. Oh, I, I, absolutely. And th- that's the problem. You know, you show a fight to a couple people are like, well, you know, they weigh the same. Why can't these guys get together and fight? And then you right. have to explain it, different right. promotional banners. And it just and by that work. time, they're already tuning out. <laughs> Absolutely. They're like, yeah. why, why can't it just happen? Because, you know, the fight, I mean, they used to do the best they could to make the fights that yeah. people wanted. I mean, I, that's true. That's and the, the thing is, the good fights are still happening. I Absolutely. mean, you, you know, if you're a, a, a just a general sports fan and you watched, um, you know, uh, the Brandon Rios, Mike Alvarado rematch. You're gonna love it. You're gonna you you were gonna watch all twelve rounds. You were gonna wait around for the decision. It's not like you were gonna watch one or two rounds or one and a half rounds and then be like, okay, I'm gonna click away. You know, if you're a sports fan at all and you relish competition and you relish action and drama and excitement, you know, boxing will deliver. It's just that it's not being delivered to the general public and it's it, the the best fights are not being delivered on a consistent enough basis to attract the casual fan, make them a hardcore fan and keep them a hardcore fan. Cause a lot of times the sport will attract the casual fan and make them a hardcore fan and then frustrate the hell out of them until he's got to leave. You know, the, the, it, 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 the sport will pull fans in and then it'll push them away with the politics because fans are going to want to see certain matchups. And then there's all these excuses why the fight is not going to happen. Well, he's with this promoter and he's with that promoter and he's on this network and he's on that network or he wants more money and he wants more money or, you know, there's all these lines in the sand that are drawn and the media, I mean, the, 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 you know, the people who kind of, you know, convey boxing to the general public or, you know, who, who cover the sport, we get all caught up in that stuff. We get caught up in the politics. We get caught up in the business and we're no longer writing about a sport, so I mean, how are sports fans going to be interested? Well, that's, or stay interested? That, that's absolutely it. Uh, the The problem with sports when it, it it's when you're talking about individuals that have individual contracts, and there's you know choices being made, is that you know things don't happen in the NFL. The two best teams of the year, of the year theoretically are going to end up playing each other in the end. It's and, set up that way. Yeah, right, exactly. And, and we don't have that. It's um, unfortunately. I mean, when you have your big mailbox and you answer all the questions, and I can only imagine all the questions that you get in there, but do you get tired of just running across questions and you're like, there's no point in answering this. The fight cannot happen. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I get, you know, at some point I got tired of, um, you know, Mayweather Pacquiao. I got tired of, even if it was a, a, you know, a nice rational email about it, it was just, I, I felt like I was wasting my time explaining why it's not going to happen or may not happen. And I was one of those cynical folks that didn't think it was going to happen. You know, I, I kind of figured if it, if it didn't happen in 2010, it probably wasn't going to happen. You know, I mean, I kind of yeah. held out hope, but I, you know, I, I can't help but be cynical um, with, uh, you know, certain certain scenarios in the sport. Um, but, yeah, I get, I, get, I get tired of it, you know, and I get to, I don't want to analyze a fight that's probably not going to happen. You know what I mean? I don't mind, like, for fun, you know, going over a mythical matchup. Like, you know, hey, what would have happened if Aaron Pryor would have fought Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., both in their – I'm sorry, Julio Cesar Chavez Sr., both in their prime at 140 pounds. You know, that that's fun and all. But, I mean, it, there's an added note of frustration when you're kind of doing a mythical matchup scenario for a fight involving guys who are active right now and are, and are on top of the sport. And you know the fight's not going to happen. You know what I mean? It's like, why get into an argument about that? You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's frustrating. So, yeah, I, I do get sick of it. And I think at some point, maybe a year and a half ago or whatever, I just said, hey, you know, folks, maybe it was just last year. I said, hey, if the fight isn't made this year, I don't want to talk about it anymore. You know, if it can't be made in two and a half, three years, 
it just it just ain't gonna happen, and I'm not gonna even print emails about it. And I think I stuck to that. <laughs> I, I, I can't blame. But, you know, you I think for it. I think Juan Manuel Marquez kind of helped me out by by cold cock and pack you out. But um, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like all right, the issue is officially dead now. Let's move on. You know, absolutely. Kurt, did you have something you're trying to say there? Yeah, Doug, you uh, mentioned, you know, when you got into the sport, you know, Muhammad Ali was king. And then, you know, later on, Mike Tyson came along. You know, over the past, I'd say, the decade, you know, the heavyweight division has slowly, you know, gone to Europe, especially with the Klitschko brothers. I mean, what what has that had impact? Has that had on American boxing, you know, not having, uh, you know, a, a big heavyweight star? Yes, it's it's had a negative impact, which I think is unfair in a way to the Klitschkos because I think the Klitschkos... Um, are about as honorable um, and as admirable um, a pair of professional athletes as you can find in any sport. Um, oh, yeah, they're agree. very rare for boxing, but if they were tennis players or if they were soccer players or they were basketball players, I mean, they they have impressive credentials, you know, just as human beings. You know what I'm saying? Um, they're good businessmen. Uh, they act, they learned their craft. They're always in tip top condition. Um, and they've put up some, um, you know, Hall of Fame worthy stats as far as boxing is concerned. But the fact of the matter is they're not American and they're not exactly American friendly. They don't have the certain swagger that, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali sort of popularized, um, you know, in the in the in the late 60s and throughout the 70s. Uh, and they don't fight in, in America often. I actually think the Klitschko's. I don't think they would ever be completely embraced by the American public, but I think had all of their fights that have taken place in Europe, prim- primarily Germany, been fought here in the States, they would have a a considerable fan base, and they would definitely have uh, a higher level of respect than they have now with hardcore fans, hardcore American fans and with the uh, U.S. boxing media, because they would be more accessible. Um, they're good interviews. They are thoughtful interviews, um, and um, they are something to see live. I've seen both guys um, fight a number of times each live, and um, I've had the opportunity to watch them train, which a lot of Amer- uh, uh, American boxing writers have not had the opportunity to see, there was a time where they were both living in uh, the Los Angeles area, and they trained at a, a, a now closed gym called the La Brea Boxing Academy. It was on uh, La Brea Avenue and Wilshire Boulevard, I believe, and um, it was amazing watching them because they are they're students of the game. I mean, they had certain guys that they had hired as sparring partners that they didn't even hit, but they would they wanted to have uh, in their camps. And they wanted to get in the ring with them just to absorb the knowledge from these guys who were well, well past their prime and no longer even fighting as professionals. And I, one guy in particular that comes to mind is Tony Tubbs, a very slick, savvy African-American fighter out of Cincinnati, Ohio, who you know, held uh, a version of the, of the, the heavyweight title, oh, I don't know, sometime in the you know, mid-'80s. Um, but he's a real crafty veteran, knows all the tricks, and they had him in that camp just to absorb from him and and they did and um the the old timers who were at the gym all, you know, these are guys who were dead now and these these were dudes in their 70s and 80s at the time one guy is a, an all-time great in my opinion boxing trainer named uh, emil carbrusa and he developed and basically made the late great carlos monzon the the great middleweight champion and i think he trained oh i don't know 13 or 14 uh major world title holders um during his his career and uh he was in that gym and uh, a local old timer named don familton was in that gym and the klitschko brothers would do their workout and then they would just sit for an hour or two and just watch these old timers try to impart their wisdom in their own young trainers and you would just watch them and then they would you know speak to each other and German, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever language they were speaking, it wasn't English, and they would talk to each other, and, and they, they were just taking notes. So th- those guys are real students of the game, total gentlemen. Um, you know, they would come into the gym, shake everybody's hand, no matter who, even people who had been jerks to them in the past, and I, I could, you know, count myself as one of those jerks. Um, just, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're gentlemen, you know what I mean? And um, they're smart guys, and they're good people, and I think... 
if they had just been in the public eye more, the American public eye, and doing a lot of um, doing a lot of interviews and, and fighting at, at Madison Square Garden and at Staples Center and uh, you know the you know the Thomas and Mack Center in Las Vegas and the, the MGM Grand and maybe even you know going to some other you know great venues um, I, I don't know like you know, maybe the uh, Auburn Hills Palace in Auburn Hills Michigan or, or the Cobo Hall you know the Joe Lewis Hall in in um, in Detroit um, they would get ink they would get coverage people would be curious and would watch them and maybe they wouldn't be blown away by their boxing style. I think they would be impressed by the end result because the Klitschko's usually do stop their man. Um, but, you know, just listening to their post-fight interview, I think there would be a segment of America that would um, at the very least come to appreciate them. And that that hasn't happened, and I can't blame the Klitschko's for it because the, the bottom line is they are huge superstars in Germany and other parts of Europe. And they make – it just makes business sense. The, the German networks, they have a deal with – shell out more money than HBO and Showtime are willing to shell out um, to broadcast their, their fights live and just the live gates that their fights do. I mean, they don't just do arena fights. They do stadium fights. So I can't fault them for fighting in Germany or Poland or, or, or wherever. You know what I mean? They're, they're doing great business um, in Europe, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not going to lie. It, it, you know, the fact that they are um, sort of the undisputed two-headed heavyweight um, champion of the world, and they're not American, it does sort of wane um, American interest in boxing. Well, and the sad thing is that for some reason, a lot of times in America, we miss the forest for the trees, and we always find something to complain about instead of um, finding something to learn about. I you hate know, it, if, <laughs> if we were if we were to if we were to take the way that K2 and Sauerland run their boxing events, oh it, it would be amazing. Yeah. They're, hey, they're pure you, entertainment. K2, um, Sauerland, uh, just in, in, in the presentation of those events, yes, absolutely. They're, they're bringing world-class um, entertainment value to the live event. They're bringing you know, production value that in America you see with pro wrestling and you see with the UFC – and you see, just with you know, general entertainment with concerts, right? You know, you know, some huge band or whatever, they 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 bring that type of production value to the live event. But beyond that, the way they do business, they're so organized, and they don't let their egos get out of control. Um, you know, in, in that same vein, um, Taken Boxing Promotions in Japan, uh, run by the the venerable Mr. Honda. I mean, they they run a tight ship, and they give the, their fans what their fans want. They don't beef with other promoters, you know what I mean? And if they do beef with other promoters, they don't make that public. You know, they kind of keep their own egos in check, and they're they're gentlemen, and um, they, they conduct their business in gentlemen, as gentlemen, and they, they, they um, conduct their personal relationships as gentlemen. And we definitely need a little bit more of that um, here in America. Where, I mean, you know, for the most part, you know, American pro- promoters hustle their asses off. They, they generally they, – they, at the end of the day, they get the job done for the most part, not all the time, certainly not enough to satisfy hardcore fans. Um, but I will say this. American promoters um, sometimes say a little bit too much publicly. Not just American promoters. Shoot. Sometimes um, you know the, 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 the network executives um, with HBO and Showtime I think say a little bit too much um, and, and allow their egos – to be pulled into the business of boxing and, and, and let their opinions be known. And some, sometimes they make negative opinions be known when it didn't, didn't need to be known, didn't need to be um, out there. Um, I think that happens too much in America. And I tell you what, it does not happen very often um, in, in Germany or Japan. It happens, it happens in the UK. <laughs> it happens in the UK, you oh, know, yeah. I, but it, not as much as it does uh, here in the, in the United States. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And, and I, I don't like the negative vibes that, that just are kind of part of uh, just being um, a modern boxing fan. It just seems like everyone is miserable all the time, and we complain a lot, and we demand. We ask for fights, and then you know, on those occasions when the promoters or the fighters themselves – just go against the promoters and managers and say, hey, this is the fight the public wants. Let's give it to them, and the fight gets done. I still hear people complain. You know, I, I, you know, like as soon as Nonito Donaire stepped up to 122 pounds, I'm hearing from hardcore fans, well, you know, is he going to fight Guillermo Rigondeaux? 
I bet you he's afraid of Guillermo Rigondeaux. He steps up. He wins a title at, at 122 pounds at his, 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 his debut at, at junior featherweight. Um, his next fight, he unifies titles, and every everyone's saying, hey, what about Guillermo Rigondeaux? Now, now, mind you, he's only been a junior featherweight for about six or seven months, but it's all about, you know, don't avoid the Cuban lefty. This guy can beat you. You know, you're afraid of him if you don't immediately call him out after every fight. He fights Toshiaki Nishioka, you know, the consensus choice for the number one 122-pounder. He dominates the dude, stops him. Uh, I think he's the first guy ever to knock Nishioka out. Uh, and then he has, like, you know, just like a stay-busy fight, you know, a money-making fight against Jorge Arce, totally faded. We, you know, we knew he would, he would whip Arce's butt. Um, and people are just, they're, 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 it's like they're upset. They're mad. They're saying, no, this guy doesn't want to fight. Rigondeaux, okay, well, the Rigondeaux fight is made, and people still seem to, uh, people, what's that, sweetie? That's my, my, my five-year-old, soon-to-be five-year-old. <laughs> okay, sweetie, when I'm off the phone, you tell me about it. <laughs> she, she wrote something down on paper. Man, her, her handwriting is better than mine. <laughs> yeah, I saw my so nieces those, the other day. <laughs> okay, the eight-year-old has better handwriting than me. All right, sweetie, I'll let you know when I'm off the phone. But, you know, I... She she needed to to interrupt me. I was, I was I'm I'm a long winded dude, but I mean my point is, fans will ask for certain fights and, and Alvarez Trout Saul Alvarez versus Austin Trout. That's that's another example. It's a fight where people you know people say okay these these guys are among the top three four or five in their division. I want to see that fight, and you have a certain segment of boxing of the boxing fan population saying. Canelo's afraid. Filipino Flash is afraid. Okay, well, the fight is made. How about giving them some credit and being happy that we've got, you know, some true hardcore fight fan matchups made? How about being satisfied about that? You know, just for once, just like take a look at our boxing schedule and look at the fights that we've had just in the month of March. Look at Bradley Provodnikov. Unexpected, Jim, but we got to be, we, we have to be, um, we have to admire the effort that those fighters put out and the great fight that they provided us. Rios and Alvarado, no surprise there. They do it again. They, they, they wage a, a fight of the year candidate. Um, and you look at the fights that are on tap in the months of April, May, and June, and you can literally pull out eight to ten Great matchups. I mean, hardcore fight fan matchups. Merez and PDL. That's going to be a yeah, great exactly. fight. It's, exactly. I mean, you know, Madonna versus uh, Josecito Lopez. Um, you know, Lucas Matisse, Lamont Peterson. You know what I'm saying? These are these are good. These are quality fights, you know. And these are fights where it's not easy to pick a winner. And these are also fights where I think we're all pretty sure, you know, as guys who know boxing, stylistically, we're pretty sure that, it's going to give us um, an entertaining contest. I mean, that's what we want. We want entertainment. We want drama. We want competition at its highest level between the best fighters. So when, when boxing delivers, I mean, it would be nice to hear a little bit more just from the fight fans, you know, especially, you know, Twitter generation, like, hey, I'm looking forward to these fights. But it seems like folks still look for stuff to bitch and moan about, and that does get a little old. Oh, yeah. We're, we're always complaining about something, <laughs> but um. You mentioned a couple of these fighters here, and I got a list of a few fighters. Um, and I just wanted to ask you that I mean, these guys are hyped up for for various reasons, and I just like to know your opinion on these guys as far as you know where you think their ceiling is. If you think um, those hyping them are in the ballpark of what their actual abilities are. Okay. Um, first one I got for you, um, Gennady Golovkin. I think. His hype right now in certain circles, and I'm one of the guys driving the bandwagon. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I admit I've, I've written stuff that is definitely hyping this guy up as, you know, special. Okay, um, I'll be the first to admit he hasn't defeated the kind of opposition that um, would normally accompany that kind of buzz. But I will add to that he has the type of style, ring style. And his fights end in a result that are going to attract attention regardless of the level of his competition. I mean, let's face it. There was a buzz on Mike Tyson, a strong buzz on Mike Tyson among regular sports fans before the guy won his first major title. 
and it was be- and he wasn't fighting murderers row but he was fighting often which is um something a goal that Golovkin has for this year and he was whacking guys out of there uh highlight reel caliber KO uh performances and and that's what Golovkin delivers so he's going to get attention if you, if you put him on HBO um He's going to get some rave reviews. And, of course, you're going to have the contrarian saying, no, you know, he's plotting, he's methodical, he gets hit, um, I'm not impressed or whatever. Um, From what I've seen, from what I know about him, you know, about his amateur background, um, I've had the opportunity to watch him train more than a few times, seeing his work ethic, um, having the opportunity opportunity to to talk to him at length and get a gauge of his intelligence, which is high – I think he's going to, to, to live up to the hype and maybe even surpass it. Wow. Maybe even beat those guys that people say, well, stylistically, yeah, he will. He will uh, wreck shop at 160. But when he steps up to 168 pounds, the guys are bigger than him and better athletes and more versatile boxers like an Andre Ward or an Andre Durrell or, or whoever, you know, Lucien Boot, then he'll be exposed. Here's here. I'm saying I don't think he gets exposed. I'm not saying he he wipes his ass with Andre Ward or even Jarrell. I'm not saying that, but I am saying um, he will not embarrass himself in against those guys, in against that caliber of opposition. It remains to be seen, but that's what I think. So I'm telling you, I I think Gennady Golovkin is the truth. But at the same time, I'm happy to admit that um, he hasn't beaten, um, you know, he hasn't beaten the the top middleweights. He's considered a top middleweight, but he has not defeated. The top middleweights. I mean, the best middleweight he's defeated was that guy Greg uh, Proxa, who was a lower top ten, right? Would you guys agree? Kind of like he, he, he a, was yeah. a poor man, Sergio Martinez. Well, right? Yeah, right. And he had, you know, he had been um, shocked by, you know, he lost a decision to a journeyman, Kerry you know, Hope. Event, but he did. He had, you know, Kerry Hope, right? So I mean, you know, obviously that guy was not a world beater, but definitely a solid fighter. Definitely um, a tough customer um, that. You normally don't see somebody just dominate him the way Golovkin did. Yeah, for for me, Golovkin just need he needs his he needs his chance. You know, it's kind of like uh you know the late Vernon Forrest. You know, they they could only hold him off so long until someone right. had to fight him. Absolutely. And, and then I mean, the only person to I mean, well, the first person to drop Mosley. I mean, Pacquiao obviously dropping him later yeah. in his career, but it, I mean that uppercut, Jesus. <laughs> um, here's another guy. This is someone I'm really huge on. Um, Lucas Matisse. Yeah, I think he's real. I, I don't I don't think there's any hype involved with with Lucas Matisse. I mean, I think he's earned his um, position in the rankings, and I think he's he's earned um, the position he holds with hardcore fans. I mean, you know, he was an unknown when he he fought um, Zab Judah, and he kind of served notice in the Judah fight, which I don't think was a robbery. I, I thought it could have gone either way. You know, they happened to be in in um, New Jersey, and and the benefit of the doubt went with with Zab. But um, I don't think that was a bad decision. I thought it was a decision that could have gone either way by a point. I had Matisse up by a point. I thought they, they both won six rounds. Matisse had a knockdown, so he deserved that fight. I definitely think he, he, he um, deserved the decision in that 10-round bout with um, Devon Alexander. I thought that was a hometown decision. I thought that was a bad decision. Um, you know, but even though he didn't get the official result, you know, he didn't get the, the official win, again, I think he served notice that he can – um, compete, um, and that he has the ability, the technical expertise, um, as well as the raw talent to, um, compete with, um, sort of elite level American boxers, um, who are also high level, um, athletes as well. And, and, he, and really since, since the Alexander fight, I mean, he's on a nice run. I mean, the, you know, the beat down of, uh, Olu Sagan, you know, who was 30, you know, at the time, very um, underrated win, very yeah. underrated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that to me, that was an impressive win. Uh, the Umberto Soto fight, um, I think he kind of corrects some of the flaws that he's had by starting faster. I mean, I think that was that, that was the flaw, that was the knock against him, uh, against Judah and um, Alexander, is that um, he kind of stayed in one speed and that he had a slow start, and he, he started faster against Soto, obviously started pretty fast against Mike Dallas. So, I mean, yeah, I think he I, – I don't think there's any, any sort of hype with um, – um, Lucas Matisse. Now, now that doesn't mean I think that he can beat every 140 pounder out there. 
That just means I think he can compete with every 140-pounder out there. Um, and I would probably favor him to beat most of them. Not all of them, but most of them. I, I would. It, it, and I have a question for you just a little bit down the road and involving that little uh, tournament that, that um, Golden Boy's got going on at 140. Um, but um, staying on this right now, let me throw this name to you. Leo Santa Cruz. Uh, he's Leo, somebody I've, I've been familiar with since he was a kid, um, since before I even knew he was a – I mean, I knew his older brother, Jose Armando Santa Cruz, and Jose Armando's brother, uh, Robert, when they were still amateurs. And I remember seeing Leo before he even started boxing. I remember seeing him at the gym. Um, so literally, this is the kid who has grown up in a boxing family, grown up uh, in the gym. And um, I didn't know he was as good uh, of an amateur as he was. I mean, he really, I mean, he beat like the best Bantam weights, you know, guys like Rico Ramos and uh, uh, God, what's the, uh, what's the other guy from Orange County? Ronnie Rios, you know, all the good local fighters, Charles Huerta, um, who were in his weight class, Chris Martin, that's another dude. All those guys, he beat all those guys. I had no idea he was kind of like, the man at 118 pounds in the amateurs, you know, bantamweight amateur king um, of the Southern California area. I didn't even uh, realize that. Um, but I've always liked him as a professional. Um, I was happy when he finally kind of found a solid um, promoter, kind of promotional situation because he was with Top Rank briefly and then he was unsigned and then he was with. Uh, uh, that upstart TKO boxing, which folded, and and so he just he couldn't get any kind of momentum. He couldn't get any uh, any any sort of regular television exposure. And um, I think Golden Boy, and this is really because of um, matchmaker Eric Gomez, who had you know watched him spar a few times and kind of fell in love with the kid. Um, Gomez kind of got behind him, and you know Gomez sort of threw him to the wolves, kind of tossed him down a well a couple of times with some tough guys. Um, that Jamoye guy that he fought in Mexico, that was, that was a tough customer. Um, and then uh, the uh, former uh, title holder from Puerto Rico, uh, what's the guy's name? Um, is it Jose Lopez? Could be. I'm... I think so. Clarita Jose Lopez. Yeah, real tough, real tough customer, man, um, from, from Puerto Rico. It was like a Telefutura fight. But uh, Gomez tossed him in the well, and uh, Leo Santa Cruz just kept crawling out of the well, which um, he proved himself. And um, – he did something very special last year, which is just fight as often as possible. And I wish, I wish more young fighters would do that. But um, you know, whatever buzz he has, I think he earned uh, with with last year, with you know, winning the title, but also being a fighting champion, being a busy, active, uh, you know, world title holder. Yeah, absolutely. Just just going out and getting it. I mean, that's yeah. That's... I'll say this about his, his style: he has limits. He can be outboxed. I mean, you know, you put him in there with the dude. Um, who is um, got really good lateral movement? Who can punch on the fly? Who's um, not going to stay stay in the pocket too long with them? Um, you know, he can be outboxed. He can be he can be defeated. It's not going to be easy. It's kind of like you know putting in somebody who sticks and moves against Brandon Rios. Yeah, you can you can neutralize him to a degree, but you're still going to take punishment. You know, uh, you know, uh, Mike Alvarado uh, fought a brilliant fight. I mean, he really did. He just fought a brilliant, versatile fight, mixed in everything, did a little bit of everything. And still, you know, even though he clearly won that fight, you know, it was a close fight, even though he clearly won the fight, you know, by the end of 12 rounds, it looked like um, a pile of bricks had fallen on Mike Alvarado's head. <laughs> and that's, he was tore up, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's the same thing with Leo Santa Cruz. I think there's going to be guys who can, um, who will be able to, to, to outbox him, particularly at junior featherweight where there's deeper talent. Um, you know, but it's like if he, let's, let's say uh, Santa Cruz fought somebody like uh, Chimito Moreno, and Anselmo Moreno. Stylistic Moreno nightmare. Beats, Moreno beats him, but I tell you what. Um, I don't know if Moreno's going to look like he was hit by a ton of bricks in the face, but he's going to feel like people were throwing bricks at his body. Oh yeah, he's going right. to spin in the fight. I'll, I'll, I'll say that much. He, it's it, it'll be a, it'll be a tough physical grueling fight for him. Um, and and that's the kind of guy that Santa Cruz is. And I also think he's the kind of guy that he can suffer a loss here and there. And I think fans will still 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 want to see him fight. Now, here, here's a guy just. Uh... Four pounds north where Santa Cruz is heading. Um, what about Gary Russell Jr.? I mean, the fastest hands I can recall seeing. 
Yeah. Oh no, and trust me, like the, I think the his first um television appearances, his first fights in front of a national audience in the US, they were fight night club shows. So I was doing the call and I was you know, it's a real small venue, uh and, and you know, I'm I'm sitting right, you know, right on the ring apron, right by the you know, one of the judges. And watching him live, it's just like, how is anyone going to handle this dude? You know, I'm I'm sitting I'm sitting ringside and I'm looking them. I, I have a side view of both fighters and I'm missing some of his punches. So I can't imagine what it must be like to be squared up with this guy facing him and, and you know, knowing what it's like to be in, you know, the, the ring with somebody who's fast. You don't see the punches. You just feel them. So it must be just um, bewildering um, t- to have to fight him. Uh, and, and, and saying that in sort of acknowledging that talent that he has, I think it's really sad that he has not been able to to really get any um, career momentum going. I think um, I think towards the end of 2011, maybe he was the consensus choice for prospect of the year. And what happened in 2012? Consensus He's, pros consensus yeah, choice for prospect, prospect of the year. <laughs> and I, and you know it, it's I, I don't want to pick on on Gary Russell, but I mean there's something something has happened with. The, the amateur program or with the way fighters who are um, the, the, the highly touted U.S. amateur standouts, they turn pro and maybe they're used to, um, you know, kind of being prima donnas or maybe they're, they're making too much money or their, the, their managerial arrangement or their promotional arrangement is a little bit too accommodating and, and uh, they're not pushed hard enough or if there's some kind of character lacking. But you look at all of the top talents that came out uh came out of that 2008 u.s olympic squad none of them are contenders i mean there's already been another olympics we knew the the new olympic squad is 2012 usually by this time the 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 stars your 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 best athletes and, and and best boxers most skilled boxers from the previous olympics have at least established themselves as contenders, if not major title holders, but you don't see that with um, Gary Russell Jr. or with Demetrius Andrade, who I think was also a world amateur mm-hmm. champion. Um, you know, uh, this guy, this heavyweight Deontay Wilder, is not super skilled, and he started boxing late, like a lot of American heavyweights. But there's no denying his athletic prowess. I mean, he is a physical specimen. I mean, he, the dude is a tremendous athlete. You you would think by now he would have fought like at least a fringe contender. That hasn't happened. He's still a prospect. I just gotta wonder what's up, man. <laughs> you know, uh, well, I, I think it goes Russia, back even further. For the 2008 Olympics too. You I know, think so. What the hell? What the hell happened to Sean Estrada? What the heck happened with uh, uh, Molina? This guy Javier Molina. He's a terrific boxer, terrific talent. And I don't I don't know what what happened to these guys, but there's something something's missing. I mean, they, I think you're right. I mean, they they all made the 2008 Olympic team, and none of them have gone beyond being prospects yet. Four years later. Well, even going back further, I mean, you have Andre Ward, where there's something in him, whether it's his faith or just the way he was raised or something, where he's just a tremendously grounded person. Where, yeah. on the other hand, Andre Durrell, I am so tired of even hearing his name dropping <laughs> out of fights, yeah. running his mouth. Yep. And it's one yeah. of those things, and he has so much talent. It's just one I of those think things he has where more talent than Ward. I think Darrell is more athletically gifted. I think Darrell is more athletically gifted than Andre Ward. Um, however, if they if they ever fought, I would pick Andre Ward in a minute because guess what? Character counts in this business. He'd break Character down count. break down Darrell mentally. He would break him down mentally. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. So, um. No, I don't know what's happened with certain, you know, certain U.S. amateur stars. Uh, it's it's well, frustrating. And that yeah. fight against Frotch, you know, in the world of boxing forums, you know, what I mean, the most common that we have, you know, because, you know, there is no language barrier is the Brits and the Americans. And right. having to defend his running against Frotch, it was. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, but anyhow. I, didn't. I, thought, <laughs> hey, I thought he won, but I didn't defend. I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't make us think about it. You know, I thought Darrell did enough to outpoint Frotch, but you couldn't complain about the outcome because of the manner in which Jarrell fought or didn't fight. Yeah, and that was the fight where I actually grew to respect Carl Frotch more because it became clear after the fight he just expects people to come in there and try to trade some punches with him. He wants a damn fight, you know? 
and that's what he's all about. So, um, moving on from there, uh, let me ask you, I, you know, bringing up that, that, you know, the, the elephant in the room of boxing, uh, the, the PEDs mm-hmm. now, what damage to the sport do you think PEDs have really done at this point in time? You know, considering that there's so much behind the scenes that the average boxing fan can't comprehend. I mean, what are we missing possibly that is going to be incredibly detrimental to the sport going down the road? Well, I, I don't know what we're missing. Um, you know, th- I, I, this isn't my area of expertise, um, but I, I, I can assume that we're missing a lot. And I think what's detrimental, performance enhancing drugs is de- detrimental to boxing, is that um, we've come to a, um, a point where we assume a lot of our elite fighters are using performance enhancing drugs, whether there's proof or not, or whether there's a past history or not. And, and that's a big problem. And, and that sucks. I mean, I, 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 I didn't like it at all when, you know, Juan Manuel Marquez scored like the most significant victory of his, you know, Hall of Fame career uh, against his arch rival, his nemesis, basically, Manny Pacquiao. And you got people, you know, accusing him of things, you know. But I mean, that's 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 pro sports. That's modern pro sports. It's just it's happened enough to where a fighter actually has to worry about how his body looks. A boxer has to worry about um, being too muscular or showing too much power or showing uh, too much physical strength or showing um, resilience, things that boxers are supposed to show. You know what I mean? They have to worry about being suspect, you know, and um, the only, it's kind of like you're guilty until proven innocent. You know what I mean? It's like if a boxer in this era is not doing what Nonito Donaire is doing, which is undergoing random drug testing year around and making the results of that drug testing public, there's always going to be a little bit of skepticism or, um, you know, some, some, some suspicions out there about um, a fighter who operates consistently on the elite level Do you- or, you know, goes beyond uh, the limits of, of human endurance. Absolutely. Um, but you, just, you know, it's, it's getting, you know, into the, you know, where, you know, we're not scientists, so we don't know for sure, but do you have any, any fear or, or doubts or, you know, just the, the thought sticking in the back of your head that it is possible that the science of PEDs is just moving at a slightly quicker rate than the oh, science yeah. of testing? Oh, I think so. I mean, it's that way in other sports. It's been that way in other sports for decades. It's been that way in track and field and cycling, you know, for for decades, you know. Um, Boxing is slow to catch on because the culture of boxing for so many decades was to lock the rest of the world out. You know, the gym was a place that was just for the fighters and they had the old ways, which was, you know, you know, very old school. You know, you, you eat red meat. You you, you 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 abstain from sex, you don't lift weights, you know, all this stuff, you know what I mean? You, you run in military boots, you know, long, slow distance, you don't do sprints. And gradually, modern training methods have worked their way in to the sport to where it's now modern practice. Boxers have better diets now than they, they had in previous decades. Um, they're mixing different types of, um, uh, you know, training uh, into their conditioning routine. Um, so it was only a matter of time before the, uh, you know, ad- advanced supplements and, um, you know, illegal or banned performance enhancers made their way into the boxing culture. And the thing about boxing is it, it's slow to catch on, but once it does catch on, it makes up for lost time pretty quickly. They, it, it catches on fast, and I, I think that's happening now. I mean, I think, um, I mean, it's – we're, we're – we're, we're, eons away from you know fernando vargas taking some pills from some you know weightlifter that he um allowed into his camp 10 years ago or 11 years ago before the oscar de la Hoya fight i mean they were huge just from that year to you know the kind of um performance enhancers that shane mosley used in his rematch with with de la Hoya. de la Hoya. um that was just like one year later but there was a significant advance in the type of um performance enhancing drugs that were used and now we're 10 years beyond that point so i mean i have to assume um that what's out there and what's available to to these athletes 
and what some of them might be using is far more advanced than what whatever it was that that, that Shane Mosley used um, going into that rematch with with, uh, with De La Hoya. Um, and I, I mean, I can't keep up with it. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm trying to learn, um, you know, learn as I go and learn as much as I can. Um, and I, I have, I have questions. I mean, I've got questions, um, you know, particularly about, um, you know, uh, synthetic testosterone and why so many of these young athletes, um, like Lamont Peterson and, and, and like Nikki Bay needed to go to, a um, a physician, a doctor, a specialist, and have their their testosterone levels boosted. I'm wondering what what's happening to these young men that they would have abnormally low testosterone when they are still in their 20s, when they're in their late 20s, going into their early 30s. When you know uh, a, a young, healthy adult male um, shouldn't have these problems. I, I I still and I still don't know. I I still haven't heard why that is. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's one of those- you know, as far as I've heard it, it if and the thing is, it kind of makes you like seem like you're implicating people no matter what. And I yeah. like, like to refrain away. By, by the away way, from I'm, that. I'm not yeah. implicating. Yeah, abs- you know, absolutely. my website had a lot of trouble recently <laughs> involving yeah. Lamont Peterson, and you know, we we you know we had to make a, re- a retraction, and um, you know, um, you know, hopefully that a, you know a scenario like that will never happen again with our publication. Um, you know, we're, we're you know we're going to be more careful. Um, I don't want to cast doubt on any fighter, and I've been I, I've, I've taken a pretty strong stance on that regarding Manny Pacquiao. You know, rumors about Manny Pacquiao, rumors about Mayweather, rumors about um, uh, Juan Manuel Marquez. You know, no, you know, there has to be diehard proof. And you know, in the case of Peterson and Bay, that you know they had um, you know medical evidence that they that their testosterone was low, and they had this procedure done. Um, and you know, that, that, that boosted their testosterone, um, you know, uh, but I'm just, my, my question is, um, you know, and Bay, Bay was a little bit better about, you know, dealing with it. I mean, you know, maybe he learned from, from Peterson's situation. He, he let people know, or at least let his physician know that, you know, you, he, he can't receive anything that could be, um, construed as a performance enhancer. But I still think that when athletes have these procedures done, whether it's synthetic testosterone or something else, uh, another type of, of, of hormone, synthetic or otherwise, um, they need to um, let their promoter know. They need to let the, the state commission know, um, and they need to let the the um, oppose the, the 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 management of his opponent know as well. I mean, they, th- there needs to be transparency, and people need to be public about um, their medical procedures in in the world of professional sports, and particularly boxing. Uh, which always sort of has a, a high degree of suspicion um, and, and, and cynicism. So, you, yeah, I think you have to be extra careful with boxing because people are just a little bit more paranoid in the boxing world than in the regular world. And I, I just think, um, you know, you, when, when, when fighters undergo these type of procedures, we, you know, we need to know why. You know, what was it? Was it a, a thyroid condition? Did they have some kind of illness? Were they overtrained? You know what I mean. There was, there's got to be a reason for a young man to to need to go and 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 um, replenish his testosterone supply. That's not out of the ordinary for a man in his fifties. I mean, that's nature. But for a man in his late twenties, there has to be a, a. I mean, they're saying there's a medical reason, but I'm just like saying, what is that medical reason? What what is it? You know. And and you know, the, the questions that are out there, and that's. I mean, that's that to me is that's the cloud of of PEDs. Is that it? Sort of takes the the attention off of the fighters and off of the fights and onto, you know, what what else are they doing? You know, what else is going on? Absolutely. Well, and the sad thing is, you know, you, when you break down into, I've been doing a little bit of reading. It, you know, one of the things that can deplete your testosterone at a young age is steroid use. Well, right. <laughs> um, so it's it's just yeah, one so of those. So the question's going to be out there. So when you say yeah, so when you say well, yeah, I needed, I had low testosterone. I'm 28 years old, I'm 29 or whatever, and I woke up one day and, uh, you know, I had developed breasts or something, you know what I mean? I went to the doctor and he gave me a shot. It's like, well, wait a minute, why? Did, how does that happen, you know? How? Yeah. And, and, you know, the sad thing is you can – you almost have to control how good your performance is because yeah. if, if – let me say this. If 
Ward had beaten Dawson the way he did at 175, which I think he would have. I think too much is made of the weight. If he would have done that at 175, Andre Ward would be implicated as a steroid user 30 minutes after the telecast. That's what sucks. That's what totally sucks. But anyway, let me throw this to Kurt. Kurt. That too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but obviously, <laughs> we gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me throw this to Kurt. I know he has a couple of questions for you there too, Doug. Kurt. Yeah, Doug. I mean, we were just talking about you know hype or truth about you know currently active fighters, but I want to talk about a fighter you know he's no longer with us, and that's I know you know him as well. You've interviewed him. That's Edwin Valero. I think right. he you first met him in I think it was two thousand and three when he came to the states. Absolutely. I mean, wow, wow, years ago, time flies. Holy yeah, crap. I think, you know, in, you know, on, on the internet and social media, it's like you get polarizing views. You get one side who, you know, believe that he was the truth. And, you know, if he, he if he was given the bigger fights, he would have, you know, become a star. A bit like how people are looking at Golovkin now. And then there's, right. the, other, there's the other side who are like, you know, this guy was a limited brawler. He, he would have been exposed right. the first time he stepped up. But I know you, you know, you saw him in camp and up, up close and personal. What are your opinions on how good he could have been? I thought he was going to be a star. I, I thought he was going to be a superstar. Um, I, I'm not saying that he would have been unbeaten after 40 or 45 pro bouts. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying even in his losses, he would have performed to a level and put on the type of fight where he would have been like a Thomas Hearns, where it didn't matter that he got knocked out in three rounds or that, you know, he was stopped late in the fight or whatever, because the fights would have been great. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like Thomas Hearns came up short against Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh, he came up short against Marvelous Marvin Hagler. But those were great fights. And he's looked at as a great fighter. And he should be looked at it as a great fighter. And he was a tremendous attraction. And he wasn't just a star in boxing. He was a superstar. And that's how I viewed Evan Valero. And uh, to me, Valero kind of had the – he had that, that God's gift of just knock you out, you know, just, uh, you know, one-punch knockout power or, you know, real, you know, r- real heavy hands the way um, Thomas Hearns had. Um, and, but he had that with this sort of Latino swagger slash machismo – that Roberto Duran had, and um, he had kind of what Duran had developed. Actually, Duran even had it when he was in his prime as a lightweight. He just didn't get credit for it because he was he was such a devastating puncher at lightweight. But he had subtleties to the sport, subtle technique and defensive ability that people didn't credit because he, he could be such a ferocious fighter. But you saw those subtleties as he got older, as he moved up in weight particularly as a, a junior middleweight and as a middleweight. Um, and you, you see all the, the nuances and the finer points of boxing that Roberto Duran had an understanding of. And I think, um, you know, when at, as the level of competition would have increased for Edwin Valero, because before he, he, he took his life, um, he was just starting to break it out into the, uh, in, you know, into viewership on um, major American television. I mean, his last uh, fight was against Antonio DeMarco, and it was it was on Showtime, and that was the first time he'd been on American cable. So he was just starting to kind of like show people beyond YouTube clips or just beyond you know you know small pay per views and all that. Um, but he showed us in that fight that he had some footwork, and I, before that, I'd heard that his feet were always planted, or that his feet were in cement, or that he 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 didn't have any footwork, or that he didn't have any head movement. And I knew that wasn't true from just watching him train, but that was that was like one of the general perceptions on him. And I think as as his competition would have moved up, if he was fighting somebody like Top Rank had plans of matching him with Lamont Peterson. Um, there were talks about him fighting Timothy Bradley. Um, personally, I think he beats both guys. I think these would have been great fights at 140 pounds. But I see Edwin Valero um prevailing in both fights and i and i think he would have stopped both guys late but they would have been tremendous fights i think those guys had a level of talent and tenacity that would have forced edwin to use all of the tools that that he had at his disposal but often didn't use because he didn't have to if he could go out there and blast a dude well guess what that's what he was going to do he was going to go for the short night rather than the long night that was just part of his mentality he's a puncher but he could box his technique wasn't always the sharpest because, you know, he was a hard-headed dude and didn't always listen to, 
his trainers when he had a world-class trainer, and for long stretches of his career, he didn't have a world-class trainer, and, and in fact, trained himself. So he was always in great condition, but his technique was sometimes sloppy, which didn't mean he didn't know how to box, because boxing guys is being able to hit your opponent and putting yourself in a position where they can't hit you back. And he could do that. He could do that just on his talent. He had hand-eye coordination and hand, I'm sorry, eye-foot coordination where he could stay out of range. Um, but, you know, his chin was in the air. You know, sometimes his punches weren't very sharp. Sometimes he would drop his hands a lot. So he didn't have the sharpest technique. You know what? Neither did Muhammad Ali. Neither did Roy Jones Jr. They got away with it because of their level of talent. I think, you know, um, because of different talents, uh, I think Edwin Valero got away with some sloppy technique for long stretches during his career. Um, but the bottom line for me is, uh, to me, he wasn't hype. He was never hype. He was always the truth. And um, I, I, I totally understand people thinking, that, okay, well, he was hype because often he did look sloppy. Sometimes he did get into, uh, you know, exchanges with lesser fighters that he didn't need to get into with. But, you know, doing when, when he did that, he, in his mind, he knew he was going to come out on top because he had more power than most guys. And, you know, he could take a shot too. He was a tough guy. Um, but I think he – honestly, I, I believe he would have – you know, whoever thought he was hype, had he still been fighting today, I, I don't think anyone would be calling him hype. Whether, you know, whether he'd be undefeated with all knockouts or not, I don't know. Um, the fight I, I wanted to see is like the, the dream fight um, uh, for me that, that uh, to me is, is the, fight, the one fight I wanted to see more than any other dream matchup um, is uh, Valero versus Pacquiao at 135 pounds or 140 pounds. And I, I, I would have picked Valero in that fight. Um, you know, in, in all likelihood, Pacquiao would have, would have probably got him. But I'm telling you, it would have been so explosive, no one would have cared about the result. No one would have cared. Both guys would have been elevated. Uh, and Pacquiao being who Pacquiao is, you know he would have fought him again. Pacquiao's not afraid to give a guy a rematch or a third match <laughs> or a fourth match, you know, what I'm no matter yeah. how tough the fights are. So to me, Pacquiao would have elevated um, – uh, Edwin Valero, whether Valero would have won against them in their first fight, Pacquiao would have elevated uh, Valero to, to not just star status, in my opinion, not so humble opinion in this regard, uh, superstar status. That would have been a great fight. I think Valero would have won too. I think the, the, the thing with Valero for me is I think he was too crazy to hurt. Any sane person that was in Ibea Bucci shoes against Tua would have been right. floored multiple times, but he was too right. crazy to be hurt. He's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, keep going, Kurt. I know you got a couple more there. And I was just going to say, and in that, in his last fight as well, you know, he suffered a terrible cut, and he just, he just brushed it aside and just carried on. Didn't bother, didn't bother him at all. It, it, he, you know, he felt the initial pain of the elbow. Kind of looked to the referee to be like, hey, that, you know, that was an elbow, right? And they, they keep fighting. Blood's in his hair's in his eye. The blood's in his eye, and then the bloody hair is in his eye. And it don't matter. You know, he, it, it, what he did is he kind of made an adjustment to where. It was strange because his vision's impaired, but he kind of took the fight more on the outside and it was kind of more of an in-and-out attack instead of just staying on top of, of Antonio DeMarco. And I'm kind of glad it happened because it was another sort of proof that he could handle adversity. And I thought he showed that in his first title fight in 2006 against uh, Vicente Mosquera, who was very underrated, a real monster out of Panama. And he went to Panama to fight him, and it was the first time – he had to fight beyond two rounds, and it was a championship fight, so he had to go 12. And he was dropped in the third round and um, picked himself up and um, just fought like a tiger um, into the late rounds. I think that went to the 10th round before um, Mosquera's corner stopped the fight. But um, to me, that fight answered all the questions that I had about Valero's chin and heart and uh, ability to handle adversity. But I, I understood that other people had those questions about him. And uh, I was kind of glad that that happened in the DeMarco fight because he, he he had to deal with some adversity with the blood, and he kept his composure, and he boxed a little bit. He used his legs, and he showed he had good timing moving in and out because he wasn't a tall guy, and he's in against a tall guy. And he was able to, to get in and hit and not get hit in return. And to me, uh, you know, I, 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 it was a small victory for folks who had Valero's back. It was like, yeah, I've seen him do this. I know, I know he's got footwork. And he showed that footwork, and it just—it was just a little wrinkle to you know what is now just kind of like an urban le legend or an urban myth. But it's like, you know, it adds to that what if, what could have been. Yeah, and you know another controversial figure is you know Antonio Margarito, and I remember reading a, 
uh, I think it was an interview on Boxing Scene, and they made, I think they got maybe got it from your mailbag, where you said you didn't believe that um, he he didn't know what was in his gloves prior to the Mosley fight. I mean, do you, right. do you think that, and why would you think that? Yeah, I do. I, I, I do. And, and by the way, I totally understand anybody believing that he's been a criminal his whole career and that he's loading his gloves. His, he's had been loading his gloves his entire career. I had a conversation with Max Kellerman um, shortly before uh, uh, this, this past Saturday's show in Las Vegas, and Kellerman expressed that. He said he believes that um, – Margarita was always just sort of an average fighter who was just tough, um, and he was made into a special fighter because he always loaded his gloves, to which I didn't believe. And I, and I told Max I understood why Max believed that because Max said, well, you know, once he was busted, he never, lo- he never won a major fight, never looked the, the, the same, never scored a, a, a knockout. And, and I understand that. And, and, and what I pointed out to Max is, I, you know, I said, Max, when he won – the biggest fight of his, his career in the summer of 2008, the pinnacle of his career against Miguel Cotto, he took a lot of damage in that fight. And you have to realize that even though he wasn't an old man, Margarito had been a professional boxer for 15 years and absorbing punishment in all of his fights, but also in the gym. The way he trained was the kind of training that burns a fighter out. So it's when you're a fighter of – uh, with Margarito's uh, style, and you're taking as much punishment as Margarito took. I mean, he had a great chin, and he just took it out there. Um, you're going to have a steep decline, and you know it, it, it wasn't surprising to me that it happened after the the mostly fight. But um, one thing that I had that Max didn't have is having covered Margarito's career going back to 1996, going back to when he was a nobody, going back to when he wasn't even being trained by Javier Capetillo. I remember Margarito then. I remember covering Margarito's fights for newspapers, um, you know, against the likes of Rodney Jones, which he lost in Culver City. I was at that fight um, as media, and, you know, when he uh, upset a guy named Alfred Ankama uh, on a forum boxing card. And um, I told Max he always had damaging punches. Now, he wasn't able to, to heap a lot of damage on Rodney Jones because Rodney Jones was a – uh, you know, a tall southpaw boxer who stayed on the outside, you know, kind of like a winky, a poor man's winky right. Um, but I said everybody else, and not just in fights, but in training, they got they got busted up when Margarito put hands on him, even when they had he- uh, headgear on and the big gloves. And he said, well, he was probably uh, loading up his wraps for, for the sparring sessions. And I just like, I'm saying, well, you know, yeah, and I heard that. I heard people make allegations about that, you know, um, after he was busted uh, in the Mosley fight. Some of the one of the guys that he had sparred with, um, you know, during the Mosley camp said, "Yeah, my eye socket got busted," and I, I believe his his, um, his hands were loaded. But here's the thing: if they were doing that, they were doing it in front of everybody. I mean, he, it's not like they went to a private room to have their hands wrapped before every training session. His hands were wrapped right there in front of everybody. He always had an open camp. He never shut out the public, never shut out the media. You could follow him anywhere in a gym. You could watch, you know, most of the interviews that were done with Margarito, going into the Centron rematch, going in uh, to, to the Cotto fight, going into the Mosley fight. When you went to visit him at the gym, Top Rank had a publicist, publicist there, a guy named Bill Kaplan, who's now – he's a publicist with uh, Golden Boy Promotions. But at the time, he was with Top Rank, and what – Bill Kaplan would do was sit the media and it'd be a bunch of us. It wouldn't just be one guy. We would surround Margarito and his trainer Capetillo while Margarito's getting his hands wrapped. So I'm thinking, okay, if this dude has been loading his gloves every time he spars and every time he fights, that must make Javier Capetillo the most devious, sneaky criminal mastermind in the history of boxing to be able to pull the wool over that many commissions, over that many inspectors, over that many people in the gym, uh, you know, uh, sparring partner trainers, um, media like myself, members of the public, they were able to just like magic slip in some loaded wraps every time this guy trained and every time this guy fought. To me, that sounds ludicrous. I mean, honestly, that that to me that's that's ludicrous. And I'll add a little something else, and, and which which I really irks me about the Margarito scandal. And that is, I, I fully support and agree with the California State Athletic Commission's 
decision to strip Capetillo of his license and to strip Margarito of his boxing license after that incident, before the, the Mosley fight, the, the rules are, 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 are very clear. You don't have any kind of, you don't, you, you can't even have wet hand wraps, you know, uh, when you're wrapping your hands, there's a certain amount of gauze and wraps that are, um, allowed, um, for, for a boxer's hands going into a professional, um, fight. But everyone writes that he had hand wraps dipped in plaster. And that's not the truth. Most of these people saying this have never actually seen the evidence, never seen the wraps. You know, they were some old, wet, bloody wraps, and they didn't have plaster on them. If you read the report or if you, you know, covered the commission hearing, there were traces of substances that could be used in plaster. And it could be like chalk, chalk and water, you know what I'm saying? And if you talk to commission, and I've talked to some guys on the commission who used to be with the commission who are no longer with the commission. And I asked him, well, how, how much of these traces were on the confiscated wraps? And he said, like a pinch of salt. So that's the truth. But what's written out there is that he had, like, like he had pieces of plaster okay. in, his, in, his, in his wraps or in his gloves. Or his wraps were, like, dipped in plaster of Paris. And that's just not true. And I'm not saying that we should look at Margarito as a sympathetic figure because, you know, the sad truth is Margarito made out very well following this scandal. For starters, he had Bob Arum, who kind of made it his, his, his personal mission to get him, you know, recommissioned somewhere in the United States and to get him a huge fight. But I'm going to say the boxing media, my peers among boxing writers who grandstanded so much and got on their soapbox – and vilified Margarito, I will say that they did something that the great Hall of Fame promoter Bob Arum could not do, and that was they made him a viable, marketable B-side for a pay-per-view star like Manny Pacquiao or for a pay-per-view star like Miguel Cotto. They made him a villain. They gave him a black hat and made him interesting for the first time for HBL's 24-7. For the first time among casual fans, you could recognize this guy because he never got any recognition when he was just an honest welterweight title holder who was willing to fight all of the top 10 contenders of his division. He was that one guy who would fight a Paul Williams or an undefeated Kermit Centron or a once beaten uh, Joshua Clotty. He didn't get any notice and he wasn't selling tickets and he didn't do great ratings. But after being made into the villain, into the bad guy, suddenly he's a pay-per-view B-side and he made a lot of money with the Pacquiao fight and um, a substantial amount of money with the Miguel Cotto rematch and enough for him to retire comfortably. And um, I got to say, he has all those people who vilified him in the media. He has them to thank for that. And he's aware of it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so for all those folks who, who, who crapped on him and vilified him and all, all you did was make him more marketable. And uh, Robert K. Aram took advantage of it. And this villain, this guy who you guys said belongs in jail, he benefited financially because of that. Yeah, a lot of people tuned in to uh, just to see Pacquiao take him out. You know, <laughs> just yeah. like, yeah, let's just yeah. watch Pacquiao. Guess and what? Then... He got a piece of that pay-per-view upside. <laughs> Guess what? He got a piece. <laughs> he didn't just get paid a flat fee. He got played seven figures plus a piece of that pay-per-view upside, and it was substantial. Oh, he, 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 went, he went laughing all the way to the bank, you know, and they, they perfectly cast Margarito, though, and this whole incident fit into that persona well. I remember the first time that I knew Mar Margarito was just like this big, mean man was before the Cintron rematch, and he was like mocking Cintron with the crying stuff. <laughs> it's just like, I'm like, man, th this guy's just pure evil. He's just out there to kick people's asses. Not a nice guy. No. <laughs> but, he's a dude. He's a bully. He's, he's a bully. A, He's a dude. He's a dude who, I mean, you got to be a rough dude if you're going to choose boxing as your profession when you're 16 years old. I mean, that, uh, you know, you, you got to be hard. And that's a hard environment that he came out, you know, that he came from. It's like the Eddie but, Guerrero uh, of boxing, man. <laughs> what was that? It's like the Eddie Guerrero of boxing. I don't know if you ever no. watched you wrestling back in the day, but yeah. that just came to me. It's not bad. Yeah. So, um. Let me let me ask you this real quick here, um, and then give a couple more questions over to Kurt. Who do you think 
is a prospect right now that's flying under the radar and is going to make a splash. Maybe not like a huge splash, but in the manner of the way Austin Trout, and some people said, you don't know what Cotto's getting into with this guy. Right, right. Who, who do you think has that going for them right now that's just going to totally just come in and upend somebody out of the blue? That's a good question. That's a really good question. I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I, I'll be honest. I'm hit and miss on these under-the-radar guys. Sometimes they turn out to be an Edwin Valero or a, a Gennady Golovkin. Um, and then other times they turn out to be Ishmael Salak. You know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. you see a dude who's just, I mean, kicking everyone's ass in the gym. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, has the, the amateur background and, and has the talent. And, it, you know, for whatever, you know, for one reason or another, you know, with Salak, it was his chin just doesn't pan out. And I'm not, I'm not closing the book on Salak, by the way. I still think it can be a, a, a tremendous light heavyweight. And the guy who beat him, Grachev, has gone on to do quite well. So, I mean, that, that makes that loss look a little bit better. But the bottom line is, um, you know, uh, Salak is back to being under the radar. <laughs> so, um, so I, yeah, I don't know. Gosh, that's um, – I really I, I can't think of anybody right now. I mean, I don't know, Kurt, if, you, if there's any young prospects out there that, um, you know, I the guys that I'm 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 really excited about as prospects right now. You know, they're not under the radar. I think it's harder to be under the radar these days with with um, you, know, you know the internet and social media and you know hardcore fight fans always out uh, uh, on the lookout for the next guy. Um, but there's a guy, you know, um, Jesse Magdaleno. Um, who I like a lot. I think he's a, he's a tremendous prospect. Um, I believe junior featherweight, um, a lot of young talent at junior featherweight come to speak. Yeah. Come you to know, think a, g- of it. a guy I always, if he's so criminally inactive, I thought Brad Solomon might've turned into something, but he oh, yeah. just doesn't fight. Yeah. Well, he's not, you can't even consider him a prospect anymore. Mm. Uh, I mean, he's kind of like a fringe contender with a lot of talent. Um, you know, who's, I guess, who has had managerial slash promotional problems that, that have kept him out of the ring, which is, uh, you know, which is just too bad. Um, but I got to be honest, I'm kind of I'm kind of coming up with a blank with like, you know, that next guy or whatever. I mean, had, you know, had you guys interviewed me a year and a half ago, I would have said Golovkin, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, somebody right now who's got like a real strong buzz you know, in the, you know, in the gyms and everything right now. And, it's uh, tough with the internet, you know, because yeah. I mean, so many people get to see this, that, and the other. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, kind of moving in with that, um, who do you think of the last 20 years was the most underrated fighter that just does not get their due considering what, what they had going for them as far as talent and even accomplishment? Well, there's a lot of guys who, I mean, just came came around in the wrong, you know, wrong, wrong time, wrong place in the last 20 years that, you know, had they, had they been in a different weight class or come around a few years later, they would have won a title or maybe even two titles. I mean, I think about Obakar a lot and who he had to fight when, when, when he got his shot at the welterweight title. I mean, he had to fight an undefeated Felix Trinidad, an undefeated uh, Ike Corte, and an undefeated Oscar De La Hoya. And he gave his all in all three of those fights. And he had his moments in all three of those fights. Um, and unfortunately, he goes down in history as an also-ran. But he was a, he was a tremendous prospect. We used to you know, watch on um, USA, USA's Tuesday Night Fights. And uh, you know, he was a, a, a solid top-10 contender for many years. And just was never able to grab that major title because of the... The era, you know, the the in fact of the matter is that you know he came around in the '90s, and the the guys who held welterweight belts at that time were un, not just undefeated, bigger guys, but they were tremendous talents, you know. I think Corte is underrated. I mean, you brought Corte him up is as... underrated. Ain't no doubt about that. Yeah. Corte, I, you know, I love about Corte is he was that one welterweight title holder who dared to fight. The welterweight title holder, who people didn't—they didn't even want to mention his name out of Durango, Mexico, uh, Jose Luis Lopez. You guys, remember him? Remember he fought Corte and it was a draw. Corte basically outboxed him just with his jab, slammed him with his jab. You know, like probably won eight out of the twelve rounds, but uh, Corte got dropped twice and hurt really bad by this dude. You guys don't remember Jose Luis Lopez? I, it's just not under, ringing a bell right now. Amazing take. Okay, look him up on Box Rec. WBO welterweight title holder. 
from Durango, Mexico, where mm-hmm. Oscar De La Hoya's father is from. And uh, legend has it, De La Hoya's father said, I will not let you fight this dude. He's too dangerous. Yeah, the dude had amazing talent. He just never had the hunger and dedication to the sport. He's one of these dudes, one of these rare boxing guys who grew up middle class, maybe even a little bit upper middle class, and had other interests. They liked to surf, like to cycle, bit of a hippie. You know, he smoked weed and stuff. But he was, um, he was, uh, he could, he had a chin of iron. He could walk through the biggest punches anybody could throw. And he was a tremendous puncher, particularly with his left hook. Took out some Irish dude, popular Irish dude, to win the WBO belt, which was kind of lightly regarded at the time because this is like mid 90s, you know. And um, he fought uh, Ike Corte and held Corte to a draw because he dropped Corte twice and hurt him at least once. And he had an amazing fight with James Page. He fought James Page for the WBA welterweight title. That was on uh, Showtime. And I think this is still uh, late 90s, maybe 98 or something, 99. And uh, what a fight that was. And he had, man, Page won the fight. Because Page just um, just gutted it out and outworked him. But um, he had Page down. He had Page badly hurt in that fight a couple of times. But look him up. He, I'm, he, I'm he doesn't that. get any props. Obviously, you guys are like, who the hell is this? Yeah, no kidding. There, there you so go. There's, there's, there's a dude. There's, I'm telling you, man. That dude, if he would have had the dedication and maybe if he would have had, like, the right trainer, you know, behind him or the right promotional situation, man, that guy was a – he was a beast, man. Lopez. He was a beast. I'm going to have to check out. He was, like, the first guy to make Yuri Boy Compass just quit. <laughs> just turn his head and quit in the ring. Like, oh, no. You know, I mean – Felix Trinidad was the first guy to beat Compass and bust him up, but Lopez was the first dude to make Compass just say, no mas, nah, dude, never that, mind. You got to be a bad man for a guy that's still fighting, you know, 15 plus years later with, you know, 100 victories at this point in time uh, to yeah. make him just quit. Yeah, yeah. And this was still when, when Compass was still, you know, somewhat in his prime and was still a puncher. Now, who, who do you think was the most overrated of the last 20 years on the flip side of that coin? Wow, overrated. I, I'll, I'll, Arturo Gatti for exposed. me. What Arturo, was that? Arturo Gatti for me, actually. As much as fun as he was, yeah. the talent level just wasn't what a lot of his fans would like to say. To me, I mean, he, he I, I can't underrate his ability to excite a crowd and to draw fans. I mean, he was practically a, a sports franchise in, in Atlantic City, and that can't be understated, but... He was his. He was overrated to a point where he was a first ballot Hall of Famer, and I think that's where he's overrated because there were other, there have been other fighters who were very popular, did great ratings, sold tickets, and um, you know they brought just as much blood and guts as Arturo Gatti did every time they fought, and they but they don't get the kind of credit that Arturo Gatti got. You I know what I mean? Naz deserves to be in the Hall before Gatti does. I agree. Yeah, he was a better talent. He was a better talent, and he and he, he accomplished more. And, um, you know, he beat better guys. I mean, yeah, to me, Nas, Nas gets a check mark from me. I don't know why people are hating on him, but maybe it was just his, his personality or whatever. But one thing, you know, you know, having come around, you know, uh, at a time when Nas was still on top and covering some of his fights, um, Hamed was a cool cat, um, you know, when he was away from the cameras. You know, he kind of had a boxing persona and, and then he was himself and he was actually amazingly humble for a guy with the level of fame that he had, he, I mean, he had fame on, on multiple continents and he was making a lot of money. That dude was making incredible record making money for a featherweight or, you know, even fighter, you know, sub welterweight fighters. He was making record amounts of money and he was pretty down to earth. He was a pretty cool cat. That's cool to hear. Um, and I have one more question for you and then I'll turn it over for, to Kurt for the last questions before we have to go here. Um, and, and it's just, you know, obviously because of your position with the ring, um, do you think that boxing fans blow the relationship between Golden Boy and the ring out of yes. proportion? Hell yes. Yeah, they totally do. I can't, I mean, again, I can't, it's like people who want to call Edwin Valero hype or Gen- Gennady Golovkin hype. It's their opinion, and I can see where they're coming from. I can understand why they say what they say, because the bottom line is... Golden Boy Promotions owns the Ring magazine. They own the Ring brand. They own the website, ringtv.com. So, I mean, I, I can understand that. But, I mean, when I look at our ratings and when I look at the content on our website, 
we cover everybody. We don't favor anybody. I mean, if we're going into a top-ranked show, believe me, there's going to be a lot of stories on that top-ranked show. I don't like boycott top rank. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so you didn't I, cancel it. You didn't cancel your HBO subscription. No, why would I do that? <laughs> you know? I mean, they they have they got great fights coming up, and Showtime has great fights coming up, and I think people. I mean, you know, and they do it. What I don't like is when people just say, you know, that. You know, uh, the ring is just a, a tool of Golden Boy or whatever, and they don't back it up. I mean, can you give me something? Can you tell me why? And, like, I'll ask people. I'll get into Twitter battles with some of these folks, and they'll just have, like, one beat. They'll be like, well, you guys drop Josecito Lopez from the welterweight rankings, and Victor Ortiz is still up there. So that's that's gold. Like, that's one. Okay, I, and I agree with them. That's a bad call, and that's one that will, I mean, we're going to rectify it. I mean, the thing is, the way our rankings are done, it's by committee. We have a big panel. They're all opinionated, and they have different opinions, like most boxing people. They really do. And there's nobody whose opinion is greater than the other. It's not like my opinion's better than Marty Mulcahy's, who's on the, the, the panel. You know, if, if I will say one guy has the most pull, has the most influence in the, 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 the ring ratings panel, I'd say it's Anson Rain- Wainwright, and the reason I say that is because Anson is always the first guy to give his opinions on every division. Anson watches all boxing. He knows all of the results. He's a crazy boxing nut who, I mean, he is intimately familiar with, like, the, the 12th best, uh, you know, uh, flyweight from uh, Thailand or, 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 or South Africa. You know what I mean? He, he's he has this great international knowledge and passion for the sport, and he's the first guy to weigh in. And he goes from the heavyweight division all the way down to the strawweight division, and gives his opinions on fights that happened the previous week. And everyone piggybacks off of him. So in a way, he kind of leads things. You know what I mean? Like he'll kind of set the tone on how we're going to rank. And I'm not saying that he's responsible for. Josecito Lopez dropping out of the rankings, by the way. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if there's anybody who has any influence, it it's – I think people have this this bizarre fantasy that Oscar De La Hoya is on the panel and that he's calling us or that Richard Schaefer is calling us. And that, and, and that's not – that's that that doesn't happen. They got, they got better things to do. They're not involved in the rankings process. They don't tell us what to write. No one has ever told me what fight to cover. Or who to write about. So, uh, you know, it pisses me off when people say that. Because, to me, they're lying. And they're not backing it up. And that pisses me off. But at the same time, I understand that fight fans are a little bit nutty. That sports fans in general are very passionate and very extreme. Um, and and they, have, um, they're, they have very absolute pictures of the world. So, it's like there's right and there's wrong. And, uh, unfortunately, for a lot of Golden Boy people... I'm sorry, for a lot of... Uh, Hardcore fight fans, anything Golden Boy related is just wrong. They just want to hate on Golden Boy. And I understand it. I mean, Golden Boy is like the 800-pound gorilla, just like Don King was in the 90s. You know, in the 90s, Don King was the man in boxing. I mean, he had most of the talent. He had an exclusive relationship with Showtime. He did, I mean, you know, he put on all the huge pay-per-views and anything that bad that happened in boxing, it was Don King's fault. And nobody said, you know, reporters didn't say anything good about Don King. And fight fans didn't say anything good about Don King. And it, it, I guess in a way it just kind of comes with the territory. And the fact that, you know, Golden Boy Promotions does own the ring brand. We're going to get some of that hate. We're going to get some of that. And I I got to accept it. I need to stop arguing with people on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go. I, I oh, asked yeah. from Missouri. So I'm like, show me. You know, and sometimes, I mean, it's, it, it, it's good in some ways. I mean, you, people can grow and relationships can be formed. Because, I mean, I, I didn't really know Mark uh, Ortega, and, you know, he was just, te- you know, he was one day, this was months ago, you know, he's firing shots out at, 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 at the ring. He's like, you know, the whole rankings is just to crown, you know, um, champions, you know, who were popular American fighters, you know, w- whether it's Golden Boy or Top Rank, all the guys who are going to hold ring titles are going to be Golden Boy or Top Rank fighters. And I'm like, show me those matchups then, you know, tell me potentially in every weight class. You know, because I'm looking at heavyweight on down to just super middleweight, and I don't see any Golden Boy or top rank guys. You know, and, I was like, and I'm looking under, 
you know, uh, junior welterweight or lightweight, and I don't see any top rank or golden boy guys. Like, well, you know what I mean. You know, the, the marquee divisions. And I'm like, well, 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 show me, tell me, you know, tell me what you think is going to happen. And he's kind of like, uh, and he finally, we're going back and forth on Twitter. And he's finally like, well, I don't know how you guys figure out this stuff. I don't understand how you guys come to your rankings. And I'm like, what, you know, you follow boxing. You say, you know, boxing, you love boxing. You've been following it your whole life. You follow everything. Why don't you join the panel? And most guys tell me to go F myself. And Mark said, okay. You there know, you go. So he did. And, and you know what? He's a productive member of the panel and he's writing stories for for ring dot com. And, you know, I you know, to me, that to me, that that was something positive that came out of a little spat. And I try to keep it civil, by the way, you know, with the whole Twitter thing. But I mean, nine out of ten times, the Twitter argument, it just goes around in circles. Absolutely. They don't stand. They just wanted to, they just wanted to shoot some. They just wanted to spew a little venom. And I shouldn't have I shouldn't have spat back or I shouldn't have let the venom hit me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it's the same way on boxing forums. You know, we have the same arguments over and over and over, and over again. again. It, it's so, a, let me def- I'll defend the ring for for a second here, just um, for you know, given so someone a non biased opinion for anyone <laughs> listening to the interview here, if they consider you biased, although I I wouldn't, especially after a conversation here. Um, in defense, if you look at the 126. Uh, ring title, what happened there, even though I don't agree with the one versus three, you had Mikey Garcia, Orlando Salido, neither one of them, Golden Boy Fighters, and they went out of their way to make that for the lineal title. That yeah, within and itself. By the way, the, the panel was not 100% in agreement for that. The majority was. Chris John they, doesn't fight anyone. You know, what are you going to do? Just off that, uh, that Chris John was skipped over. Um, he doesn't you know, fight anyone. The, what can you do? Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I felt, I, I had always felt that. Chris John was still arguably the best featherweight, but more people on the panel and the editorial board felt otherwise. They felt that he was winding his career down and was taking soft spots and was never going to fight a significant fight again. And that's, that's their opinion. And that's, you know, that's the thing about rankings. It's a lot of opinions, you know, Um, I wasn't against the ring title being up for grabs with Mikey Garcia and uh, Orlando Salido. Um, But I, 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 I could understand an argument against it, um, which you know a few members of the panel had, and and it was a long discussion. In fact, I, I think I wrote up the the ring ratings review um, on that particular matter, and I actually included a lot of the discussion in the ring ratings update that was published, you know, on on RingTV.com for everybody to see, because I want to have transparency, um, you know, and I think it has helped a little bit, but I think there's still just those folks out there that just they want to have something to to deride and chide and we're kind of an easy target yeah <laughs> we um, are <laughs> let me send this over to kurt for uh for one last question here um and uh yeah kurt yeah well, well actually my question was going to be about the rankings i mean the, the criticism that i see with is not actually with the divisional rankings it's actually with the the pound for pound list and that's where i think a lot of the criticism we've Golden Boy and Ring with like Adrian yeah. Broner and Robert Guerrero, but right. I know I hated, ch- I hated, I hated, the, I hated Broner being there. Yeah. And I was open with it. I didn't, I didn't, t- I didn't, I didn't agree with. Ch- you know, the problem with that was we had this panel and nobody ever weighed in on pound for pound rankings. No one ever did. Occasionally, a pound for pound rated guy would fight and somebody would mention it, like Marty would, and Marty, Marty's only comment would be, "Yeah, so and so fought." They're pound for pound. I have no opinion on this. I can't wrap my mind around a mythical rankings. I can't wrap my mind around – this is what he would write, a rating system that actually has no criteria. You know. So he's like, so I have nothing to say. And then you'd have a bunch of guys, and I was one of them. I would reply, ditto, same here, You know, so, you know, whatever, mental masturbation, whatever. We'd do that, and there, were, there was a few guys you know, like Mike Coppinger. He would, you know, he would like, I think so-and-so should be ranked in the pound for pound or whatever. But most of us didn't. So it was kind of like Chuck Giampa's decision kind of got out there unchecked. And I didn't agree with it. And I was totally public with it. I did not agree with it. I don't think Broner should be top 10 pound for pound. But having said that, I think a lot of people do think he's pound for pound. Whether they rank him in their pound for pound or not, I think people believe He's pound for pound because when people talk about who he should fight, people they they don't think he has any challenges in the 135 pound division. 
And when you ask them who's going to beat him at 140, they're like, well, I think so-and-so can give him a good fight, but I think Broner will win. And when he, just, when he says he's going to go up to welterweight and fight a, a, a top 10 contender at welterweight, Malinaji, who holds a belt, nobody believes Malinaji has a shot. Nobody's giving Malinaji a chance against this guy, which tells me people have a very high opinion of Adrian Broner. And for some people, that's what pound for pound means. For Chuck Giampa, that's what pound for pound means. You can't beat this guy. Nobody in his weight class can beat him, and nobody around his weight class is going to beat him because his talent is that obvious. That's how Chuck looks at the pound for pound. And to a lesser extent, that's how Michael Rosenthal views the pound for pound. I'm not. I'm to- With pound for pound, I'm totally about what you accomplished. There's benchmarks. There's, there's a compliment. You've got to like conquer your division and then move on to another division. You don't just win a title. You unify titles. You do stuff like um, No Needle Denaire has done. You know what I'm saying? You do something like that, or you do something like like uh, Andre Ward, Ward uh, or uh, uh, Sergio Martinez, and you, you you take on the best fighters of your division, and you say, "I'm king of the mountain." You know what I mean? Like that. You know that that to me is pound for pound. But other people don't. They don't look at it that way. They look at it like, well, pound for pound means. You rate them against the elite fighters, against themselves, and you pretend if they wasn't weight, if weight wasn't a factor, who would win? Well, I don't see anyone beating Adrian Broner. I don't see anyone beating Floyd Mayweather because no one can touch him. He's unbeatable. So he's pound for pound, you know. And you, and you get into these arguments, which, by the way, they never end. There's never a conclusion to them. But I, like I say, I, I totally understand people's criticism. With you know, Adrian Broner is a is a, a Golden Boy Promotions Al Heyman managed fighter um you know he's he he's very talented um but uh, you know has he proven to be an elite fighter has he proven he's proven to be an elite talent but has he proven to be a pound for pound guy like andre ward or needle donaire have i don't think so but other people disagree with me i just i want to sneak this in um before before we close out because you just his name keeps coming up here and i have an opinion on this guy and curious if yours is matching or or if you're going to disagree with me but i argue that i believe that the best nonito donaire is better than the best version of manny pacquiao what would you think on that yeah i i would agree with that i don't think he is as he's not as formidable of an offensive fighter as, as the, the best version of Manny Pacquiao, but he's a more uh, natural talent. He's a more fluid boxer. His athleticism is on par. He doesn't have the explosive power of a Pacquiao, a prime Pacquiao, mind you, but he's more, he can do more. He's a more versatile boxer, he, and he can be a striker. He's a, a terrific counterpuncher. He has, and he has the kind of talent where his peripheral vision is like, omnipresent i mean he sees everything and when he strikes um he generally gets results and uh yeah i i agree with that as a matter of fact and as a matter and this is another thing that kellerman and i talked about is um he's arguably the best fighter pound for pound i agree Argu- i think he can make that ar- and and has been for a number of years and, and he's not just showing that super talent like Br- broner's showing but he's beating the level of opposition and dominating a world-class level of opposition on a consistent basis over years in different weight classes, which is something that Broner hasn't done yet. Yet. I'm not saying Broner won't. He might. Yeah. Probably will. Well, but he hasn't yet. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the subtleties with Donaire that I think people miss. You know, everyone's like, oh, wow, that knockout of Arce was amazing, but we all expected that. They didn't right. pick up how he did that. Arce moved in a half second period. Arce yeah. moved his gloves three inches further out away from his face, and Donaire's right. left hand was there as soon as it happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tell you what. I know uh, Guillermo Rigondeaux was an all-time great amateur. I know he's um, advanced very quickly in the pro ranks, and he is a tremendous counterpuncher, boxer, uh, good puncher. Um, he's got Kool Aid for blood. But um, I think he's going to be in a world of crap against uh, Donaire. I think it's going to be tough for him to draw a bead on Donaire. And once Donaire figures out, you know, finds a flaw or, or finds an opening, and once he strikes, I, I think he's going to end that fight rather quickly. 
Well, yeah, I mean, if if Marikeen's uh, left hook off Guillermo Rigondeaux's temple yes. can stagger him like that, the yeah. hook of Donaire, I it seems obvious to me, but we'll find over. out. Be, yeah, we will find out. You know, we will, absolutely. It's a fight I'm looking forward to watching. Absolutely. It's a great fight. Doug, th- thank you so much for joining us today. You can check out um, his work in Ring Magazine and also at ringtv.com. Also, Doug, uh, for, for anyone that um, doesn't already know, what it, what's your Twitter handle? It's just Dougie Fisher, at Dougie Fisher, D-O-U-G-I-E-F-I-S-C-H-E-R. Fantastic. And uh, do you uh, have any parting words for our listeners before we go here? Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> I am a very long-winded guy. And we've been, yeah, we. This has been a two-hour, at least two-hour plus interview. So, and, if but, I've bored you at any point, I apologize. Doug, we oh. we've learned a lot from you, and it was an absolute pleasure. And I really hope that we can do it again sometime. Absolutely, guys, anytime. Cool, fantastic. So, like we said, go check uh, check out Doug Fisher's work there at RingTV.com, and also in the printed version of Ring Magazine, one of the few printed uh, boxing magazines still available. Um, as always, thank you for Kurt Ward for being here, our producer. And uh, come join us at BoxingAsylum.com and uh, follow Doug on on, uh, Twitter. We'll see you guys again on Sunday for another podcast. Thank you very much.